Well, thank you. Uh, we're now in the second part of our morning session at the Boston meeting, and we're going to be hearing a panel on strengthening local committees of correspondence. And I'll introduce the panel members. On my left is Michael Zimmerman from Oberlin College in Ohio. Sitting next to him is Mr. Jack Friedman from Long Island, a retired uh, high school biology teacher and department chairperson. Also now working, I guess, at one of the local universities, Hofstra, I believe, isn't it? On the far side, we have Frank Lovell from Kentucky and the Kentucky Committee of Correspondence. Uh, Frank, I believe, is in which city? Louisville. Louisville, thank you. And next to him is a substitute. We uh, had planned on having Richard Wakefield from the Ontario uh, Committee of Correspondence. Unfortunately, his plane didn't take off, and so he will not be with us. And in substituting for him at, at a very kind offer is Ronnie Hastings from Waxahachie, Texas, who has had a hand in, uh, did I get that right? Yes, yes right. I got it right. Has had a hand in uh, exposing some of the more flagrant uh, abuses of the Biloxi River channel. I will start off with uh, Mike Zimmerman, and each one will talk for a few moments about what's going on in their states, what, how they have had a hand in it, and then we'll have a, an open mic, so to speak, panel discussion between them. about briefly is the Ohio Committee of Correspondence. Um, the Ohio Committee has been reasonably active over the years in large part due to a very small number of people. Um, I have not been one of those people for, uh, until recently. I think what Jeannie Scott said before is, is really critical. The National Center, the National Office can do an enormous amount, but it can't do anything without um, work and support at the local level. What is important is somehow reach out to people at the state level, at the grassroots level, and get them involved into this organization. Um, the way I got involved was through um, Frank Zindler, who some of you may know. He was active in the New York um, Committee of Correspondence, then moved to Ohio, and founded the Ohio Committee of Correspondence, and started out um, running the newsletter of the Ohio Committee of Correspondence. A couple of years ago, Frank who was swamped, came to me and said, uh, he wants to give up the newsletter, well, would I edit it? And I looked at him and laughed and said, of course not. And he looked at me and said, uh, and went away and came back about two months later and said, well, my doctor claims I'm going to die if I don't give it up. Um, will you edit the newsletter? And it was difficult to say no at that point. And that's what I've been doing. What, what is being passed around is at least one issue, um, one recent issue, I hope, of, of the Ohio newsletter. Um, to show you what, what can be done at the local level pretty easily. And what I want to talk about is um, what I do with that newsletter and why I think newsletters at the local level are important. One of the things that's, that is important to recognize is that it's very easy to preach to the converted. It's very easy um, to publish something that people who agree with you will read and um, to make points that everybody already knows. It's easy to do that. It's not very um, effective to do that, however. One of the reasons, though, it's, it's worth doing something like that is unless you have, I believe, unless you have something like a newsletter um, that comes out regularly, is, is um, concrete, is something people can hang on to, have some information in there, it's very hard to expand your, your base at the grassroots level. You need to be able to show people that the grassroots organization is doing something. You can talk about fights at local school boards. You can talk of, about, perhaps, fights at, um, in the le state legislatures. But unless you have something on paper to show them that, hey, if you 
you give us five dollars a year or ten dollars a year, you'll get something for it, they're much less likely to actually give you that money. That's one reason. The second reason that I think it's important to put out some sort of a newsletter is because it allows you to put some information, some useful information, <coughs> down on paper and get it into the public schools and try to share the, what you have, what people in the local committees are doing um, with, with high school and junior high school and even elementary school teachers. What the Ohio Committee is, is hopefully getting ready to do is um, find some money to expand the distribution of the newsletter, not just to members, but to um, members of the Ohio Academy of Science and to the Junior Academy and to um, the, into the public schools. It turns out, it's, I was really put off when I took over this particular newsletter because when I looked at the last couple of issues that um, were done before I showed up, it was clear the editor was doing all of the writing, and I, it was clear I did not want to do that. I didn't have the time, and I didn't really have the desire to do that. You know, most of us are busy doing other things, and we don't have time to devote all of our life um, to the creation evolution fight. What's so interesting about Dwayne Gish and Henry Morris is that they make their living doing that. We're doing this on the side. And so that really is an important distinction um, to keep in mind. What I found, though, is if I had, if I could claim I would publish people's writings, all of a sudden it was much easier to approach them and say, hey, tell me what's going on in your community. Tell me about the local school board elections. <coughs> tell me what your pet theory is. Tell me who the weird people are um, in, your, in your community. Um, you know, review a book for me. And all of a sudden, people began to write things. Um, as you see in front of you in the newsletter that you have, um, I've written some things in there, but my voice is, is not the voice of the newsletter. There were, there were 5, 10, 15, different articles by lots of different people. Um, it's also obviously easier for me in that I work at a college. I have um, a large number of students that are interested in the issue, that some of whom even write well, all of whom like to see their name in print, even if it's not a high quality print, um, but it is print nonetheless. But what you can do is get other people excited, and it's for that reason that I think however much time and money it takes to, to put out a newsletter, it really is, it really is important. Um, other than that newsletter, the Ohio Committee right now is, I'm sorry and somewhat sad to say, is relatively quiet. We haven't done as a committee very much. Therefore, it's even more important, I think, that the newsletter exists because it ties those people together. For one, re one, reason, is that one reason that the Ohio Committee is so quiet is that Ohio has not seen a lot of creationist pressure. And what's frightening is, as one of these newsletter articles shows, a study of, of mine suggests, or shows, doesn't suggest, that in Ohio high school biology classes, um, there is a good deal of creationism being taught. That is, in 50, it turns out in 15% of the Ohio high school biology classes, creationism is being taught favorably. And that is in a northeastern, somewhat midwestern industrial state where not very much creationism um, pressure has been in existence. And if that's happening in Ohio, as Jeannie Scott said, we need to find out what's going on elsewhere. But if that's happening in Ohio, you can imagine, or at least I can imagine, what's going on in lots of other states. And it's for that reason that the grassroots support system has to be in place. And by having something tangible to show people, you can share those ideas, you can have that grassroots body in place, so even if nothing comes up immediately, when some local school board finds itself under pressure, when some teacher someplace finds him or herself under pressure, there's a committee ready to go. And um, it's just, it is, I think, at the local level, one of the more important things that you can do. And since we're running a little behind, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. And there will be opportunity for questions and discussions in just a few moments. So write them down as you uh, think about it. And I would like to introduce Mr. Frank Lovell from the Kentucky Committee of Correspondence. Thank you. I am Frank Lovell, co-liaison with Tom Wheeler of the Kentucky Committee of Correspondence in Louisville, Kentucky. We, we actually have two committees of correspondence in Kentucky. But first, let me start by telling you about some of our Kentucky creationists and their activities. Uh, first of all, we have uh, in Lexington a uh, Dr. Ben Broderson a biomedical engineer and activist creationist who heads up a group called Citizens for Balance Teaching on Origins. This group's been fairly quiet here recently, 
Uh, but at the turn of the decade, uh, Dr. Broderson and his group made a serious attempt to influence the Fayette County School Board to adopt as a policy the teaching of creationism. And in reaction to this effort, Kentucky's first Committee of Correspondence was formed, the Citizens for Effective Action in Science Education, or CEASE. And one of the original movers and shakers in CEASE was our own Jeannie Scott. And happily, CEASE was indeed effective in halting or roadblocking Broderson's effort uh, to influence the Fayette County School Board. Now, I can't give you a lot of details on that because that happened before I got involved, but I do understand it took a couple of years, actually, uh, off and on, and also that uh, in addition to uh, faculty members and uh, educators in the area, were, uh, we got support from a lot of religious leaders, isn't that right? There was a, a good bit of uh, religious concern about uh, a policy to this effect. <laughs> but that's what gave birth to our first uh, Committee of Correspondence. The present liaison, and CEASE is still there, and the present liaison for CEASE is Henry Cole, whom you may recall co-authored uh, a couple of really excellent papers uh, with Dr. Scott regarding creationist scientists' participation in, or really a lack of participation in, I should say, publishing creationist research and refereed scientific research literature. CEASE has been relatively inactive as a group lately, however, uh, there being no present overt creationist threat in the Fayette County area or central Kentucky, uh, but Henry Cole is confident that CEASE could be activated and, and mobilized very quickly uh, when such a threat arises. And I became involved in the creation evolution public education controversy in 1982 in my home of Louisville uh, when I began writing letters to the editor. Uh, primarily, I, my interest was piqued uh, not only by the Arkansas trial, uh, but by the publishing of a Gallup poll that said that 44% or about 4 out of 10 of every Americans really did believe that the Earth is only six to 10,000 years old and was created more or less as we see it today. That was staggering given that the attempt by the Gallup poll was to cover all strata of education, economics, and geography. So 4 out of 10 uh, were, at least according to that Gallup poll, open to the idea that we haven't been here very long. So that's what got me piqued. And over the next uh, couple of years, I wrote uh, about two dozen letters in the two big Kentucky papers. And in early 1984, I participated in a one-night kind of informal debate with a local minister of the Church of Christ at a meeting of the Global Free Thought Society. And this debate, uh, because of this debate, I, I got involved in a fascinating, what turned out to be a fascinating series of correspondences with another minister in the Lowell area, minister of the Church of Christ, who is also a political activist. And that led uh, into my being, uh, well, I don't, I don't want to say trapped, uh, because at the time, yeah, I want to do this. Anyway, I ended up in a four-night, that's four-night, four-consecutive night public debate on evolution, creation, and uh, the, the ministers of the Church of Christ and their people are are very formal and very serious about debating. Uh, they do it with a great deal more rigor and, than the ICR uh, folks. Anyhow, that happened, <coughs> and that was in 1985, and they brought in uh, a professor of uh, mathematics and dean of students from Florida College up to Lowell. What I really wanted to do was debate another local, uh, but uh, apparently they couldn't find anybody willing to do it. Uh, so they brought this fellow in, and we had a four-night uh, debate, uh, which you can read about in the January, February 86 issue of Creation Evol Evolution Newsletter. I'll just say here that I found it a very humbling, character-building experience. Uh, uh, the fellow that I debated, Dr. Payne, is a marvelous public speaker. And while he hardly said anything in the debate over the four nights that was scientific, what he did say, he said so well that it really didn't matter. <laughs> The audience was uh, uh, Christian fundamentalist by and large, and putty in his hands, which left me basically frustrated. And I thank these gentlemen uh, in private, but I do want to publicly thank Ken Miller and David Milne, Fred Edwards and Henry Cole, and Ken Saladin for all the material that they sent me in preparing for this debate, material without which I would have been totally creamed. And to tell you the truth, I think I might have been totally creamed anyway. <laughs> Another Kentucky creationist is uh, Dr. David Aiken. Uh, he lives in uh, Frankfort, Kentucky, which is not far from us, and he was Dr. Payne's uh, scientific advisor in the debate. David Aiken is a PhD biologist, 
turned full-time gospel minister. And uh, he heads up an activist creationist group called the Foundation for Origins Research and Education, Incorporated, in Frankfort, Kentucky. He's a very active creationist who frequently travels to give lectures and series of lectures, week-long series of lectures uh, on evolution creation and his version of scientific creationism or special creation. Uh, he gave a week-long series of lectures at Purdue University uh, earlier last year. And he especially likes to address high school educators, teachers, and uh, as well as college uh, educators. And he prides himself in not being a member of or holding to the ICR school of uh, persuasion. Uh, prides himself in avoiding their, the, their standard errors. Uh, but of course he has created some errors of his own. He takes the approach that both creation and evolution are true, or that is that microevolution is true, but not macroevolution. And he argues very convincingly uh, before the public and many biology teachers that there are two distinct theories of evolution, uh, the special theory of evolution and the general theory of evolution. And this is after Kirkett, uh, who wrote an article, uh, wrote a paper 28 years ago entitled Implications of Evolution. Well, they're seizing on this now, and they're saying, folks, there are two theories of evolution, two distinct theories of evolution. And one of them's right, and one of them's wrong. And particularly when a man like this, who has credentials in biology, uh, when he speaks, uh, he has a lot of credibility. Uh, most of the folks out there are influenced by uh, credentials anyway. They're, they're oriented toward authority and, and learning from authority. He points out in his lectures that uh, it is okay to teach creationism and encourages teachers to introduce it in the science classroom. He's published a series of articles on creation evolution in a magazine in our area. It's really a statewide magazine, but it's published in Lowell. Uh, that's entitled Justice. And Tom Wheeler and I have been extremely critical of Aiken's arguments and correspondence with him and with the, the editor of the magazine, but our criticisms uh, go unheard by his audience because uh, the editor of that magazine will not publish our criticisms. Even though we've been extremely critical of David Aiken, though, he maintains friendly relations with us by simply ignoring the criticisms. Now, these two men, uh, Broderson, who's not particularly active right now, and David Aiken are real gentlemen. Uh, they, they come across as sincere, and they, I, and they are sincere. Uh, they're gentlemen at the podium, they're gentlemen in, in person, and uh, very influential uh, folks. And, and uh, we really are kind of at a loss exactly how to uh, deal with their effectiveness uh, in promoting, because their arguments by and large uh, do contain errors of fact, errors of omission, and errors of logic. And, and yet there's little that we can do. Now I've mentioned Tom Wheeler a couple of times now. He's a biochemist with the University of Louisville. Uh, we teamed up in 1984 to begin preparing for the four-night debate. He's written many letters to the editor also promoting evolution education. Uh, in, uh, Early 1985, we contacted Henry Cole, and he suggested that we start a second committee of correspondence in the state uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, CISE was not particularly active, and we were, and the other is being uh, in a different and major city in Kentucky, people who might be interested in, that live close to us could join our effort. So we formed the Kentucky Committee for Science Education, which is the second one. And over the last uh, several years, up to now, so here are just some of the things that we've been doing. At the anniversary meeting of Sigma Xi in 1986, we presented a carefully prepared poster on creation evolution. And then we took that material and turned it into a booklet of our own, a 32-page booklet that's uh, chock full of uh, charts and graphs and things that we've put together that we hope uh, effectively refutes uh, many of the mainline arguments for young earth and for uh, so-called special creation. Uh, and we passed this booklet out at uh, talks that we give publicly, as well as at creationist talks, creationist lectures, creationist uh, slide series. And we also pass out the uh, Na National Academy of Science booklet, uh, Science and Creationism, too. We try to make a big distribution of these every chance that we get. Tom also, through the University of Louisville Speaker Bureau, last year addressed two high school classes uh, by invitation uh, who were very interested in the creation evolution controversy. And both these presentations were at different high schools at different times. They, they took several hours each. And uh, Tom generated, or there, there were follow-up correspondences from several of the students uh, from these talks. And we were very encouraged by that, that people take an interest. 
I've given several public talks on creation evolution controversy uh, at meetings of the Louisville Free Thought Society and the Louisville Philosophy Fellowships, and we advertise these and try to get a crowd in. We made our presence known at every lecture or series of lectures that we learn about in the Louisville area, uh, even if we have to drive a bit to get there. Uh, again, passing out. Uh, one thing we do is we try to ask, we try to go prepared, and we try to ask the most difficult. Uh, revealing questions that we can, and uh, that does have an effect. It does take a toll, I think. When a local Church of Christ ran the series uh, of Wilder Smith's Origins movies, uh, we did attend that, and armed with Frank Sonnleitner's thorough review of these films, I was uh, I did did my homework on four of the, of the films and was well prepared to ask difficult, challenging questions. We had a very lively discussion afterwards, even though. The audience is already bought in on all this before we even start. They show the films, if you can ask the right questions. Uh, people left those meetings with their brows furled, and they took literature that, that we passed out, and I'm pretty confident that they read it. I never did get any follow-up from them. Several of them would take the material and, and leave after our discussion and say, well, I'll get back to you on this. I'm, I'll, you know, I, I believe you're wrong, and, and none of them have ever written again. And I, I think the combination of what we presented and what we let them take away was enough for them to understand that, uh, well, at least they need to call a spade a spade, and they wouldn't try to lie to us or, or convince us that they knew we were wrong and that they had the goods, because there really is no rebuttal to much of the material that can be provided. And we try to provide that material. We were successful, Tom and I, in having a critical response published to a creationist article in one of the magazines in the Lowell area, uh, but the author published his rebuttal in that same issue, and his rebuttal uh, was even more flawed than his original article. And we've been unsuccessful in having a second rebuttal published, despite our best efforts. However, that magazine has not published any articles that offer uh, alleged scientific support for creationism since then, so maybe we had an effect there, too. Tom has written a critique of Morris's second revised and expanded edition of Scientific Creationism and provided a number of copies copies of those to people across the country who have written uh, after he announced in the Creation Evolution newsletter that was available. Tom's also written an article about the recent create uh, some new variations on the creationist arguments involving cosmic dust infall, and he discusses a new phenomenon the creationists appear to be benefiting from, uh, the fortuitous typo. There's a rage of it. <laughs> and you can read about that in the July-August 87 issue of the Creation Evolution newsletter. Tom's also uh, been in correspondence with Kentucky State selection, textbook selection officials. He's prepared recommendations for our participation in that process this year, and this is the year in Kentucky when science books will be selected for, for use for the next six years. And, and Jeannie, that's in the mail to you. Um, they all say that, right? But, but it really is. <laughs> we really also have a, a quite large critical correspondence with many local and some national creationists and with organizations which sponsor creationist activities and creationist speakers. And lately, Tom has corresponded with uh, a number of scientists whom Dr. D. James Kennedy cited or referred to in his unopposed six weeks appearance on the John Ankenberg Show late last year. Tom is preparing an article critiquing Kennedy's pre presentation. I, I, and you won't want to miss this uh, wherever it gets published. I didn't think there were any creationists who could under scholarship Bert Thompson, but I believe, by golly, Kennedy may have done it. <clears throat> and that's more or less what we're trying to do in Kentucky. We hope to learn here today is how better can we proceed? How better can we promote an accurate public understanding of the methods of science, the philosophy of science, the limits of science, and most especially of the compelling scientific evidence for evolution and against the so-called scientific creationism? Hard as we try, we're unable to reach the public the way that our opposition can. Uh, we can't get the public attention. Uh, we've been trying diligently in a variety of ways in Louisville to grind down the errors of fact and logic and omission made by local creationists and visiting national creationists. But we really don't seem to be making much headway. Now that the Supreme Court has ruled out any near-term legislative help for the creationists, they really will turn up the heat on their uh, backdoor grassroots agenda for public persuasion. And we really seem too few and uh, too poorly resourced to reach the public that the creations seem to reach easily without opposition. So I'm anxious to hear more ideas. I don't have the answers. I'm here to learn them. 
Uh, so I'm looking to hear more ideas from the panel and from the audience here about how indeed can we beef up our local committees of correspondence. Now, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Frank. And now, uh, continuing, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jack Friedman from New York Committee of Correspondence. Uh, can you hear me in the back room? Okay, great. Uh, just to give you, I know everybody gives you the history, and I think uh, you ought to understand who I am and why I'm here. Surely. How's that? One, two, three? I can count. How's that? I can't pull the board. Okay. Is this a little better? Okay, good. Uh, I was sitting where you are sitting about... Uh, 1981. I had gone to a uh, meeting just to hear Isaac Asimov, really. It, uh, I, kn I knew nothing about uh, uh, creationism. <coughs> and at that meeting, which was held in New York City at uh, Rockefeller University, I heard some shocking things. I couldn't, I couldn't believe this was happening around the country, this creationism that was being taught. And, I, and I, I, was, I was indignant, and I was upset, and I was said, why isn't someone doing something about it? And I found that uh, there really wasn't that organization. To make a long story short, I got involved. I used to drive Stan Weinberg to work uh, many years ago. Stan Weinberg was really the founder of this organization. And uh, we used to teach at Bronx High School of Science. We both lived in Manhattan, and it was an enjoyable trip up every day. The, to make a long story short, I became, I found, I became president of the National Center, helped organize it in 1983 to 88. I guess I've served my time, uh, five years as president. Um, it's now turned over to uh, Wayne Moyer. I'm sure he's going to carry the ball. I'm also president of the New York Committee of Correspondence. And again, you know, we, we were looking for leadership in the scientific community. And to, to show you the dearth of leadership, I became president. <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, where you are sitting now was where I was. And where you are now, even though you think, well, I don't even want to get involved. It takes too much time. I'm too busy. The fact that you're here, you realize there's a problem. I would like to know how many people who are here are members of their state committee of correspondence. Could I see a show of hands? Thank you very much. I would say it's about a quarter of it, and about an eighth of it is, is our own executive board. <laughs> it really, uh, we have committees in every state in the union, except Wyoming. <laughs> but when you look at them, some committees are active, and some committees are not. Some committees are uh, a telephone answering system uh, with a little message at the end of an atheist's uh, 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 message that say, oh yes, and we are also the Committee of Correspondence. Now that really is not, I mean, in the, in the past, maybe that sufficed because we had nobody else. But from where you are now, what you can do, if you're not affiliated, find out why not. Why didn't you know about this Committee of Correspondence in your state? Why aren't they active to go after you? Not that you should have to go after, after them, they should go after you. Why didn't they tell you about it? And maybe you should make these inquiries. Maybe you should get onto this committee. And maybe you should make something of a committee. The people who are not doing the job really need some help. And maybe they're not interested in doing the job. And let's say if you decided you were going to revitalize your committee, or even if the state is large, maybe you can have a separate committee at the other end of the state. Maybe the person is at one end and you need another, another chapter. That's fine. How many people do you need to get an organization working? And that's the key. If you've got 12, 15 people, that's too much. 
you'll never get anything done. You need between seven and nine people who are willing to work. Not, not all uh, chiefs. You need Indians. Not somebody to say, you should do this and we should do that, and then, oh, I don't want to do that. You need people who, are, who believe that this is important. And if you believe that it's important, and you can get a number of other people who believe that it's important, you've got it made. Because you've got help from the national. Now, where can you get these people? I, I've spoken to some people who say, well, there's no one else who really is willing to get involved. You people, I think, would be willing to help out. Maybe you should take that first step and contact the people in your state and say, what can I do to help? Maybe, maybe your, your state is not even uh, tax exempt. What we've done is we, we've, uh, from the national, because I was involved with it, with the IRS, for two years, phone calls, letters going back, we finally got tax exempt. We are a tax exempt organization. And what we can do is have all of the states become tax exempt under our umbrella. There are just a certain number of things that you have to do. They're in this little booklet. It's all on one page, and the things that you have to do, the letters that you have to send to us saying, please, that's number one, authorize the national to include you under their tax exemption. We have a copy of a letter for you all written already. It's in here. It's in here, it's in here, just like the commercials. It's all in here. We're trying to help. Uh, it's, it, they're not difficult things. If you need a constitution, I can give you a constitution. No, don't spend a million hours working on, on it. We'll get a constitution to you. And basically, the constant, you've been in organizations where they do this house work. Uh, no, none of the members could care less but hours are spent on it. We'll give you the Constitution. And by the way, you don't make... See, there's a, there's a lot of people out there who will support you, but they uh, don't want to get involved. You need seven people. Do you know how many people run the national, are involved in the national? We have about nine people. That's it. And for a long time, we had no membership. We only open the membership because we have tax problems. You know, the IRS says you need to raise a certain amount of money. Okay, we'll do that. It's, it's being handled. The point, the point that I'm making is that right now, you people can go out and start an organization in your state if you have not been contacted by your committee. Join the committee, find out what's happening, and you may find you'll be president of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you may even find that you you might be invited to go to the National <laughs> and become president of this organization. I'm sorry, but it needs to be done. It really does. There, there's, a lot, there's a lot that we want to do for you. We finally got money. Stan Weinberg did a beautiful job. Once he got, once he got the money to come in, other money followed. And now we can do things for you. But the main thing that we need to know, the national, us nine people, need to know is what's happening at the local level. Is there a legislation being introduced? Do you need some help at a school board 